For all uh, mobile organisms, and particularly mammals, including ourselves, knowing where we are and being able to find our way around, find our way back to our home, for example, find our way out to f sources of resources like food, is a crucial cognitive capability. And we've recently begun to understand what the neural basis of this kind of spatial navigation is, knowing where you are and knowing how to get to places that you need to get to. So we're now beginning to really understand what's happening in the brain that enables us to uh, know where we are and know how to find our way around and remember where the important places for us are in the environment. And this um, breakthrough or understanding really began in the late 60s and early 70s uh, with um, John O'Keefe here at UCL discovering play cells, neurons within um, the hippocampus, a part of the brain, um, in animal models like rats and mice. These neurons fire whenever um, the animal is in a particular part of its environment and a different neuron fires when it's somewhere else. And so together, this big population of neurons, if you look at the activity as it varies as the animal moves around its environment, you can tell where the animal is. So which of the play cells are firing, firing little um, electrical impulses to other neurons in the brain, that tells you where it is uh, in the environment. And those neurons are telling the rest of the brain, as the animal moves around all the time, where is it in its environment. And shortly after this discovery, uh, in the 80s, um, Jim Rank and his colleagues in New York discovered head direction cells. And they're like a, a neural compass. So the play cells are active according to where the animal is in its environment. Head direction cells are active according to which way it's facing. So it doesn't matter where it is, just where it's facing. A given head direction cell will fire whenever the animal is facing north, for example, wherever it is. A different one will fire when it's facing in a different direction. So across the population of head direction cells, the pattern of activity is telling the rest of the brain uh, which way is the animal facing all the time as it's moving around. And then um, a third kind of spatial cell was discovered much more recently uh, in 2005 by the, the Mosers in Norway. And these are the grid cells. And they're a little bit like play cells in the sense that as the animal moves around its environment, uh, a given cell will fire depending on the location of the animal. But a given play cell will fire whenever it enters any one of a series of locations that are distributed about the environment of the animal in a regular triangular array. It's a very surprising thing to uh, see given the complexities of behavior as these uh, animals are wandering around. But a given a play cell will fire whenever it goes into any of these locations organized in a triangular array across the environment. And a different grid cell will fire on a similar array of locations, slightly shifted from the other cell. So that together, a population of these uh, grid cells, the activity will move from one to another as the animal moves around. And so again, like the play cells, they're telling the rest of the brain in a special kind of way where the animal is. You could work out where the animal is from what pattern of um, grid cell activity there is. And these are found in the entorhinal cortex, which is just next to the hippocampus, and they project into where the play cells are in the hippocampus. But because they have this funny uh, repeating regular pattern of firing in the world, and each one has a shifted copy of that same firing pattern in terms of where the cell fires in the world. It's easy to imagine that these cells could be updating their firing pattern across the population of grid cells according to the movements of the animal. So as the animal moves in one direction, the activity passes from one grid cell to the next one, whose firing patterns are shifted relative to the first cell. And that will be true wherever it is in the environment because of this funny repeating firing patterns that these cells have. And so people think that uh, these grid cells are a way of interfacing uh, knowledge about self-motion of the animal, including humans, we think, uh, with the representation of where that uh, animal or person is within the world. So the play cells could tell you where you are, and the grid cells could update that knowledge given that you know you've moved uh, 10 meters to the north, for example, you now know where you should be given where you were and how you've moved. Uh, more recently uh, still, uh, here um, we found uh, some 
cells which indicate our location relative to the uh, environment around us, uh, boundary vector cells. So whenever you have a large extended um, environmental feature, there are cells again in these same areas near to the hippocampus which indicate that the, um, the animal or perhaps the person is a particular distance and direction away from a big building or a large extended environmental feature. And Colin Lever uh, discovered these cells um, working with myself and John O'Keefe. And more recently, uh, Jim Knirim in the United States has found cells which indicate the distance and direction of the animal from individual objects. So what we're beginning to see altogether is that Cells in and around the hippocampus in this part of the brain, uh, in humans that's sort of in here in the middle of the medial temporal lobes. All these different cells encoding for our location and our direction and being able to update their activity given our own movements and also cells representing where we are relative to environmental features or objects within our environment mean that we can understand really at the neural level how we can uh, know where we are and where other things are around us and where we're heading. And more importantly, perhaps for the, the idea of navigation and spatial memory, is that it's likely that these patterns of firing of neurons which define where we are and where everything in our environment is around us can be stored so that if there's an important location, like your home, you can store the pattern of activity that indicates that location. And now when you're somewhere else, you could retrieve that pattern of activity and compare it to the current pattern of activity and work out the distance and direction between them so that you know how to get back to where you were if that's where you want to go to. And one um, aspect about the regular repeating firing of the grid cells is that it's a bit like a, a binary code. It's a very powerful code for potentially very large, large scale spaces so that if you know the firing of um, the grid cells across the population of grid cells at, at one location and also at your current location, you can work out the vector between them, the distance and direction between these locations, even if they're very far apart uh, in principle. And so it could be that this system is a powerful way of knowing where you are and working out how to get to where you need to get to, which, as I said, is a, is a very important um, property for, for most mobile organisms. So looking into the future, um, hopefully uh, beginning to understand the neural mechanisms behind uh, spatial memory will enable us to understand, for example, uh, why people who start to get damage to this part of the brain, the hippocampus, as in uh, Alzheimer's disease, start to lose their way and, and start wandering off and getting lost, uh, which is a problem which creates um, great difficulties for their carers. And perhaps also it will become possible to make artificial devices, uh, driverless cars or robots, that can find their way around in a similar way to humans. Not necessarily because that's the best way to find your way around if you're a, a mechanical device, sat-nav may be more accurate, but um, if artificial navigational devices can understand how humans find their way around, then it makes them but perhaps easier to interact with in that they can have built-in knowledge of what kinds of aspects of finding our way around that uh, humans find difficult and which ones they find easy. So from all of these, um, all of these scientific experiments and, and developments, recently recognized, for example, with the 2014 Nobel Prize for Physiology uh, or Medicine, we have got a nice detailed understanding of how these different uh, types of neurons behave uh, but actually always in very simple uh, circumstances in the lab. So large, perhaps due to constraints of uh, having simple understandable experiments and also constraints of um, being able to afford small amounts of lab space. Most of these experiments are done in rather simple environments, rather small scale environments. And it's still an open question how uh, this sort of representation of your location and direction and the grid cell firing patterns uh, will really um, play out in the natural environment of a human in a complex city or a rat uh, in a large scale environment uh, of many hundreds of meters with lots of complicated um, narrow routes and so on. And so uh, although we've got a nice understanding in, of the simplest possible situations and what these uh, neurons are doing, 
Uh, it's still not clear how this will play out in, in the complexity of everyday life and how it will uh, really explain um, everyday navigation in complicated situations. But it's a very good first step. So although most of these um, initial experiments um, have been done in, in, in rodents, um, we can now, with uh, functional neuroimaging, look for the signs of the same kind of coding in the human brain, often while people um, navigate in a virtual reality video game while their brain is being scanned. And indeed, we can make specific predictions of what kind of patterns of metabolic activity we should see in the scanner, given that we know what the individual neurons should be doing if the person's spatial memory is working like a rat's or a mouse's spatial memory. And uh, perhaps surprisingly, we've seen many strong uh, confirmatory examples of the same kind of processing. You can see evidence for the presence of place cells and head direction cells and grid cells uh, and boundary vector cells, in fact, in uh, functional neuroimaging experiments with people exploring in, in virtual environments while their brain is being scanned. And with epilepsy patients who have intractable epilepsy and need to have uh, the focus of epilepsy actually removed from their brain, then electrical activity is recorded in many cases from these patients for many days. And if they play a virtual reality video game where they um, virtually move around, uh, you can also see uh, examples of recordings of uh, individual neurons that um, show where they were or which way they were headed in this virtual environment. Um, these experiments have been done by Mike Kahana and Itzhak Fried uh, largely and many collaborators. So although experiments are much easier to control perhaps uh, and implement in, in, in rodents, uh, mice and, and rats that are foraging around for pieces of food, we can take those um, important results and work out what they imply for, for human experiments. And where we've looked, we usually see something rather similar. Of course, in humans, there's much more complexity there as well, and all sorts of verbal representations and knowledge of um, semantic knowledge and so on, which we don't usually uh, study in rodents, and in fact, uh, would, would probably be impossible. And that's added on as well. But these basic spatial building blocks that we see in rodents give us a starting point to look in humans. And so far, it seems like that's a, a valid starting point.